Let our ears be made to listen and our hearts to receive. It's in your precious name that we pray these things. Amen. Yeah, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, good morning, Trinity Church family, and a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time as we are continuing on in our study through the book of Romans. Uh, looking today at Romans chapter 7, uh, as you're turning there to Romans 7 in your Bible or your smart device, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, how many of you know that eating too much sugar, salt, or fat is not good for you? Show of hands, most hands. Uh, Follow-up question, how many of you still struggle with eating too much sugar, salt, or fat? Uh, how many of you feel like this whole line of questioning four days before Thanksgiving is really not cool? <laughs> uh, my point in this line of questioning uh, is that even though we all know that we shouldn't eat too much sugar, salt, or fat, it's still a struggle for most of us to not eat too much sugar, salt, or fat. And the reason is very simple. It's for pretty much the same reason we Christians can know what God's Word calls us to and yet still oftentimes struggle to do it. Uh, it's because there is in each of us what the Bible calls uh, a sinful nature. And, and although that sinful nature can no longer dictate what we do, as we've learned in Romans chapter 6... That sinful nature, as we're going to see, can still tempt us to do even what we don't want to do. Or as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 7, verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. By the way, it was this scripture... Uh, and his own struggle as a Christian that inspired Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Treasure Island, to write the book Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, if you don't know the story, Dr. Jekyll uh, is frustrated because he's a mix of good and bad, virtue and vice. His desire to be good is often thwarted by his tendency, his strong inclination and proclivity to be bad. And so Dr. Jekyll, this chemist, creates this potion to separate the two parts of him so that his good side only comes out by day, Dr. Jekyll, and his bad side only comes out at night, Mr. Hyde. The rub, though, is that the bad part of Dr. Jekyll is far worse than he realized, especially when it's no longer constrained by any of the good in him, his unfettered selfishness spitefulness, lust, and vengeance becomes this picture of what the Apostle Paul calls slavery to sin. Ultimately, this leads to Dr. Jekyll making this confession. He says, I am tenfold more wicked than I ever thought. I'm tenfold more wicked than I ever thought. Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, speaking autobiographically through Dr. Jekyll, he says this, I discovered through this process that I am not one but two. It isn't that I am a hypocrite. Both sides of me are completely sincere. Both sides of me are completely sincere. Folks, this is what you and I experience too, to one degree or another, even with Christ in us. It's why you and I, even with Christ, still struggle to be and do what we want to be and do. There is this part of me, the real me, as the Apostle Paul will explain, that wants to do good that wants to love God, that wants to love other people. And simultaneously, there is this other part of me, the sinful nature is what Paul calls it, that wants to live for myself, that wants to do things my way, thus creating this tension, this struggle within me. This is what Paul is going to talk about in Romans 7, which at first seems like a really depressing chapter, but as I hope to show you, uh, is actually an incredibly encouraging chapter. Because even though the struggle to follow God is still real as a Christian, in Christ, it is now a struggle that we will win. Now, in order to receive the encouragement that I believe this chapter has for us, uh, we first need to understand uh, how Romans 7 is organized. Uh, Paul basically divides Romans 7 into three sections. If you want to follow along in your notes, uh, here's the way it's organized. Uh, verses 7 through 13 describe the battle that we cannot win with the law. That is before Christ. This is the battle we can't win with the law. Verses 14 to 25 then describe the battle we cannot lose because we're in Christ. And then he leads off with an analogy, which is kind of hard for our brains to make sense of, because it's like, why would you lead off with an analogy before you're making your points? But hey, it's canon, it's inspired, 
God was directing Paul, but just for your kind of organizing your thoughts as to how Romans 7 works. Verses 1 through 6 is Paul's analogy that explains the transition between these two battles, if you will. Let me just say, Romans 7 is a very confusing chapter. There's mixed metaphors in here. So I want you to try to keep this summary of Romans 7 in mind because I think that will help you to understand what Paul here is saying. So let's start with his analogy now that you know where he's going in these two battles with the law that we cannot win and with the battle that we cannot lose. Here's the analogy that Paul lays out for us beginning in verse 1. Do you not know, he says, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But, and here's the key, if her husband dies... She is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. What Paul is saying here is that before coming to faith in Christ, we were, in a sense, married to the law. We were married to the law in that we tried to earn love and acceptance from God by trying to keep his standard of righteousness. Of course, the reality, as we've been seeing in the book of Romans, is that none of us can keep this standard of righteousness. We all fail. We all fall short of this standard. No matter how much effort we put into trying to keep God's law. Because God's law, God's standard of righteousness, is moral perfection, and he does not grade on a curve. Worse for us is that the cost of failing this marriage spouse called the law isn't just divorce, but actually death. According to Romans 6.23, where we saw in the last chapter, where Paul says the wages of sin is death. The cost of sin is death. Or to say it this way, the wages of breaking God's law is death. By the way, I want you to kind of feel this. This is the definition of hopelessness. Where no matter how hard you try or how much effort you put forth to try to make someone happy with you, you can never, ever, ever hit the mark. Hopelessness. Desperation. To be married to the law, then, is to live in a relationship marked by this kind of discouragement and despair because of how depressing it is to always fall short of this spouse's impossible expectations. But in the next verse, Paul says something. He says, in Christ, we were set free from our marriage to the law. By way of the fact that in Christ we died to the law. Look at the beginning of verse 4. Paul says, so my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ. Paul says in Christ we died to the law. Meaning that through death we've escaped our soul sapping marriage to the law. In fact, by dying to the law, our marriage to the law has not only been legally dissolved. Right? That's, That's the first part of it. But, but you got to stick with me on this part. It's been legally dissolved, meaning that we can now, we no longer have to be married to this thing because we're dead. It, like I said, this is the mixed metaphor portion of what Paul's getting at. But he's saying that this, this marriage is now legally dissolved because since you're, you're dead, you can't be married. Now, now, I know what some of you are thinking. Okay, so let me, let, me, let me get this right. I'm out of a bad marriage. That's good. But I'm dead? Like, how is that better? Uh, Hang with Paul here. Uh, The good news is that we don't stay dead because right after our death certificate was signed, after we died with Christ, Paul says we were then raised to life when Christ rose from the dead. Now, if you're thinking, again, you're kind of following this logically, okay, but if I'm raised back to life, doesn't that mean that I'm now going to be back to being married to the law? The answer is no, because when we died with Christ, our marriage to the law was legally dissolved such that when we were raised with Christ, we're now legally divorced, and here's the key, and this is where Paul's going to go, we're now legally divorced, and we're free to remarry. Listen to the rest of verse 4. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law, the body of Christ, here it is, so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. In other words, Paul's point is, now we're married to Christ. Now we're married to Christ. 
But in our marriage to Christ, we're no longer straining and striving after the love and acceptance and approval that we were so longing for from our first spouse, the law. No, in our marriage to Christ, we now have the very love, acceptance, and approval that we could never get in our first marriage to the law. Not only that, but in our marriage to Christ, the riches of Christ's righteousness have been credited to our spiritually bankrupt account. Sort of like marrying a billionaire with no prenup. Can I get an amen? For, right, yeah. Lots of mixed metaphors. Here's the point. In Christ, we are now married to someone who gives us the love we've always longed for, who is also loaded. This is a significant marriage upgrade, right? Significant marriage upgrade. Now, I do want to clarify something. Uh, Our marriage to Christ does not mean that God's law is no longer in effect in our lives, as if God no longer cares whether we obey him or not. God still cares. God still calls us to obey him. And that's because God's law didn't die. This is so important. God's law didn't die. We died to the law. In fact, if you're cheating ahead a couple of verses, you'll see there in verse 6. Hold on a second. Doesn't Paul say, we've been released from the law? That's what he says in verse 6. We've been released from the law. Yes, that's true. We are now released from the law. But by that, Paul means that we are now released from our marriage to the law in that we are now released from trying to earn God's love and acceptance by keeping the law. But God's law is still in effect. God's law is still good, Paul's going to say in verse 16, which is why Paul then calls us to, by God's spirit, continue to do that which is good. Of course, the struggle to do that which is good is is still real because we don't always want to do what's good. We we don't always want to do what God wants us to do. Thankfully, though, unlike in our marriage to the law, in our marriage to Christ, God is not going to condemn us when we fall short. God is not going to condemn us when we fail. Even when we fall short, even when we mess up, even when we blow it, there is now no condemnation for those who are married to Christ, as Paul's going to say in the first verse of the next chapter. In Christ, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now, God will still convict us when we fall short, and he'll convict us because he wants the best for us. But he does it now out of love for us and with this promise that even though we may still struggle to do what he calls us to do, because we are in a battle now that we can't lose, because it's a battle now that's already been won, because Christ has already fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law for us at the cross. That's what we were just singing about a few minutes ago. In other words, the main point of Paul's analogy is that now that we are married to Christ and not the law, Our acceptance with God is settled through Jesus. It's settled through Jesus, not through our attempts to try to keep the law. Now, all that being said, Paul knows that some people at this point will assume that this means the law is bad, worthless. And so Paul, anticipating this assumption, he asks another one of these rhetorical questions that he's prone to ask in the book of Romans. Look at the rhetorical question that he asks in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? And then he answers it himself, certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Paul here is explaining that there's nothing wrong with the law. We just need to understand what the purpose of the law is. And the purpose of the law, Paul says here in verse 7, is to reveal our sin. To reveal our sin. In other words, uh, the law can't save me from my sin, but the law can show me my sin, which is actually a good thing. Uh, Think of it this way. Uh, An x-ray cannot fix my broken leg, but it can reveal that my leg is broken so that I'm willing to let my doctor fix my broken leg, thus making the x-ray while initially kind of a bad news instrument, an actual good thing. A good thing. Uh, J.D. Greer says this, Think of the purpose of the law like this. Imagine you have a full-length mirror at home with an outline of you at your ideal build and weight so that every time you look into it, you see the difference between what you should be and what you are. This is what the law does. It says, here's what you should be. Now compare that to what your heart actually is. By the way, this is in contrast to the most popular mirror that's being sold today called the skinny mirror. 
I'm not making this up. There's a real thing called the skinny mirror. How many of you have ever heard of the skinny mirror? Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, some of you are like, really? You're going with another illustration like this one four days before Thanksgiving. This is like the worst pastoral making eye contact with his people of all time. Uh, as you might guess, the skinny mirror makes you look skinnier than you really are. And it's being used by retail clothing stores all over the country. In fact, stores that utilize the skinny mirror are seeing their sales numbers increase by upwards of 18%. Because customers that try on the store's clothing while looking at themselves in this mirror, they believe that they look better than they really do in these clothes, and so they buy the clothes. Folks, God's law, on the other hand, is not like a skinny mirror, telling us sweet little lies about how good we are. No, God's law is a full-length mirror that tells us the truth about our sin, that tells us the truth about our selfishness. Now, that's not all that God's law does. Paul goes on to say that the law does more than just show us our sin. He, he says it actually, it actually stirs up our sin. But Paul says that the law actually provokes our sin. This is very, very strange to our ears. Wait, the law provokes our sin? Listen to what Paul says here in verses 8 and 9. Paul says, But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, listen, when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. Paul says that as soon as his eyes were opened to God's commandment, sin sprang to life. That seems strange. What does Paul mean by that? Well, what Paul is getting at here is that God's commands stir up within our hearts this desire to do that which is forbidden. There's just something within the human heart that does not like to be told what we can or cannot do. Raise your hand if you know this is true. All of you knew this was true. Like half of you raised your hand to acknowledge this is true. Thus making the point that I'm about to make. Right? Some of you, you knew all of this, and yet you're like, I'm not raising my hand. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> See, we do this dance week in and week out about the raising your hand thing. And today you just made my point. You, you know this is true. And when I was like, raise your hand if you know this is true, you're like, no. You and I, we, this is a dumb example, but you, here's the point. You and I do not like when someone else tells us what to do. And here's the real underbelly of this point. You and I don't like it when someone else tells us to, what to do, even when that someone else is God. St. Augustine, 1,600 years ago, he said that the underlying motive of all sin is that we want to be God. Now, we would never say it that crassly. We would never say it that bluntly. But that's what's underlying our sin. We want to be God. And that's because we were born as a result of our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve. We were born with this inherent desire to be the boss of our lives. And few things feel more like a fate worse than death for most of us than someone telling us that I'm not the boss of my life and that I don't get to do whatever it is that I want to do. And this isn't just like a grown-up thing. I mean, you see this with kids. I mean, if you're a parent, you're a grandparent, you're an aunt, you're an uncle, you're a teacher, you work with the Trinity kids. Like, even children from a very early age, they don't like to be told what they can't do. I can remember a man and I telling our daughter, Carice, at age three, not to jump on the couch. And it was born out of our love for her. We cared for her. We were trying to protect her. Carice, you are not allowed to jump on the couch. And we would even threaten her with timeouts or taking away her toys. But it did not matter. Because as soon as she heard that command, do not jump on the couch, Carice was like, you know, just give me whatever consequences will make you feel better but I'm going to need to jump on that couch. <laughs> I'm going to need to jump on that couch. Paul says this is what we are like when we hear a command from God, apart from Christ. Right? This is what we're like when we hear a command from God. In fact, Paul says here in verses 8 and 9 that there was one command in particular that especially revealed and also stirred up his sin, the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment, which is do not covet. 
Paul says here in verse 9 that before his eyes were opened to the meaning of that commandment, he thought he was a paragon of virtue. He didn't think he was a sinner who needed a savior. Why? Well, because Paul was using a skinny, mere version of the scriptures to view himself. See, as a Pharisee, Paul had this very distorted view of himself, this very distorted view of how well he kept the law. Paul prided himself on never stealing, never committing adultery, and so looking at himself right through the reflection of the skinny mirror of some external laws, Paul thought he looked great. And then came this commandment that he had sort of overlooked, thou shall not covet, which isn't really a command that you can keep externally, is it? No, it's a command straight to the heart. It's a command to be content with God. It's a command to be content with what God has given you. And Paul, when his eyes were opened to that reality of, I am not content with all that God has given me, Paul realized he hadn't kept this command, and so therefore God used that command to help Paul see his selfish heart and that he was, spiritually speaking, dead. Dead. Look at verse 10. He goes on to explain this. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Paul here is saying that the law revealed to him the truth of his sinfulness and his selfishness, like a full-length mirror that shows us what we're really like. God's law showed Paul the truth about himself, that he really was a sinner who needed a savior, that he really was a sinner who needed a savior. Now, in the next few verses, Paul is going to transition from talking about his relationship to God's law before Christ, during his pre-Christian days, to his new relationship with God's law as one who's now married to Jesus. There's still a relationship to the law. It's just changed, and he wants to unpack that. And one of the clues that Paul is talking about his new life in Christ in these next several verses is that Paul transitions from speaking in the past tense to speaking in the present tense. Notice this, beginning in verse 14. Uh, We know, Paul says, that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, he says, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Lots of stuff in these verses. Let me just summarize with a few points. Paul says in verse verse 14, the law is spiritual. Paul says in verse 16, the law is good. In other words, one of the things that I want you to understand here, there's nothing wrong with God's moral law. There's nothing wrong with the moral law. The law is God's word, God's commands, the revelation of who God is. God's moral law is filled with instructions as to how we are to live. Nowhere does Paul ever say in the book of Romans or anywhere else, now that I'm in Christ, it doesn't matter how I live. Even in the book of Romans, which is all about being justified by faith, being saved by grace, even in this book that's so focused on that, nowhere does Paul ever say, now that I'm in Christ, it doesn't matter how I live. No, God's moral law, God's word, God's commands are still in effect. Now, we will no longer be condemned if we fall short of God's moral law, But it's still the target for how you and I are to live. Which is then why Paul acknowledges his struggle as a Christian to keep God's law. Look at verses 18 and 19. As Paul continues this train of thought. He says, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. In other words, Paul here is confessing that even as a Christian, even as one redeemed and forgiven and loved by God, there is nothing good that lives in him. That is in his flesh. That's the language that he uses. In his flesh. What is the flesh? Well, let me tell you what it's not. It's not your body, bones, and internal organs. As if your body is bad, but your soul is good. No, the Greek word for flesh is sarx. And the sarx here is our sinful nature. In other words, Paul is differentiating between the new nature that's in him through Christ and the old sinful nature, the flesh, 
the sarks that's still in him. That's technically dead according to Romans 6, but it's dead like a chicken with its head cut off is dead. Where the chicken is still running around flinging blood all over the place until its death completely takes effect. Are there any farmers in the room who can verify? You know what I'm talking about here, right? Paul says his new nature and his sinful nature, they're both in him at the same time. So it's like, well, I thought sinful nature's dead. Sinful nature's dead. In the, but it's like, it's like a chicken with its head cut off is dead. Take a look at verse 20 as Paul continues to unpack this. He says, now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. See, Paul here is explaining that the sinful nature that's still in him is not the real him. As a Christian, Paul has Christ in him now. He really does. He has a new nature. That's who he really, ultimately is. And yet he says, there is still in me this sinful nature that's dead, but still running around like a chicken with its head cut off, is dead. Which is why the struggle for a Christian is still real. Which is what Paul testifies to in the next verse. Take a look at verse 21. So I find this law at work, he says, although I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. I want to highlight a couple of things here in these verses. In verse 22, Paul says, on the, he says, I delight in God's law. I delight in God's law. This is really important because uh, one of the reasons uh, that I believe Paul is speaking autobiographically about his present struggle with sin, even after becoming a Christian, is because of this verse right here where Paul speaks of delighting in God's law. There's some people who are like, I don't think this is Paul talking about his struggle. Because what happens is a, a lot of us uh, Christians, we think, well, Paul was beyond that. I mean, certainly he walked with Jesus enough, he wouldn't be tempted in the same way that we are. In fact, maybe we should be, you know, uh, sinless too. And so that drives some of the interpretation of this section. So I want to I park here for just a moment because I want you to understand what the significance and the implications of verse 22 is, where Paul says, I delight in God's law. One of the reasons I believe Paul is speaking autobiographically about his present struggle after becoming a Christian is because of this verse where Paul speaks of delighting in God's law. I want you to think about that. Delighting in God's law. What I'm driving at here is this. Unbelievers do not delight in God's law. Unbelievers might revere God's law. Unbelievers might even try to keep God's law if they have some understanding of God's righteousness and they want to they do right. They want the scales to balance out at the end of their life. They, wanna, they, they might revere God's law to try to earn God's acceptance. But nowhere in the Bible is there ever on the lips of an unbeliever this statement, I delight in God's law. In other words, Paul here is speaking genuinely as a Christian, acknowledging, in fact, I would even go so far as to say confessing that even as a Christian, there is still this war being waged within him between the spirit of Christ and his sinful nature. In other words, just because we're a Christian doesn't mean our struggle against sin is over. Just because we become a Christian doesn't mean our sinful nature just goes away. It's still there, Paul says, trying to keep us from doing the things that we know God wants us to do and that even we want to do. Again, my point is the struggle is real. The struggle is real. But here's the good news, friends. We struggle now with hope. We struggle now with hope because instead of being in a battle we can't win with the law, we're now in a battle we can't lose because of Christ. This is what Paul declares at the very end of this autobiographical struggle against the sinful nature, where he cries out this great declaration in verse 24. Paul says this, What a wretched man I am, present tense. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, he says, who delivers me, present tense, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul here says, Despite my ongoing struggle against the sinful nature, I don't despair. I don't have to despair because God promises to keep his marriage vows to me. God promises to keep his marriage vows to me in sickness and in health, in my virtue and even in my vice, even in my sin. God will not leave me. Paul's convinced God will keep him. That's what he's going to really unpack when he gets to Romans chapter 8. God's going to keep him all the way to the finish line of his life. God's going to keep those of us who are in Christ all the way to the finish line of our lives and into the glorious kingdom that he's preparing for us.
In other words, even my sins, if I can personalize this, even my shortcomings, even my mess-ups, even all of my good intentions that I fail to live up to, even these cannot thwart God's saving grace in my life. Because I have a Savior in Jesus who not only saves me from my past sins, I have a Savior in Jesus who saves me from my present sins. This is what Paul wants us to know. That our salvation is not something we need to be afraid that we're going to lose if we mess up. Now again, let me be clear. God will discipline us when we mess up. God will correct us when we fall short, when we fail. God will call us to confess and repent. And God will even dole out consequences to make these lessons stick because he's a good father. This is what good dads do with their kids. But God does all of this now out of love for us and because he is more committed to our growth and our getting to the finish line of our faith than even we are in our most spiritual moments on Sunday morning. He's committed to our good. He's committed to our growth. Now, in case we're still inclined to read this verse about Christ rescuing us from this body of death as this statement that we can now live a sinless life because some people do actually interpret this verse that way. Paul, in the very next verse, repeats himself about his ongoing struggle with the sinful nature. He says, so then, here's a summary, so then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. I say all of that to get to this point. Folks, do not buy the lie that when you become a Christian, your sinful nature just goes away. Even the Apostle Paul acknowledges that he still had a sinful nature. So do we. So do we. And here's why understanding this is so important. Let's say, before you were a Christian, that you struggled with any number of sins or self destructive habits, drug or alcohol addiction, pornography, pride, envy, gossip, greed, lust, anger, overeating, gambling, compulsive spending, yelling at your kids, cursing, whatever. But then you become a Christian. And you thought when you became a Christian, you hoped, or maybe you were even told that you're never going to struggle again with sin. You're never even going to be tempted by these things again because God's going to come into your life and he's going to deliver you from all of that. It's not true, folks. Even the Apostle Paul, author of half the New Testament, says that he sometimes failed to do what he wanted to do and sometimes didn't do what he wanted to do. Now again, that doesn't mean that the Lord can't deliver us from temptation. Please don't misquote me this morning. I was literally talking with someone this last week who, like me, comes from an alcoholic family, and he was sharing with me how God in his grace made him allergic to alcohol such that if today he drinks even a sip of alcohol, it makes him sick. So yes, God can deliver us from the temptation to certain sins or certain self-destructive habits. But that's not the same as God delivering us from all temptation to ever sin again. See, what happens if I find myself still struggling with some sin after I become a Christian is that if I don't understand what Paul is saying here in Romans 7, I will despair in my sin. I will start to say things to myself like, nothing's changed. I'm not even sure if I'm a Christian. In fact, maybe I'm not even sure if Jesus is real. Maybe the whole thing is a sham because it certainly didn't work for me. I know I experienced a version of this early on as a Christian before I understood Romans 7. And I've walked beside a lot of Christians who have experienced this too, where after coming to faith in Christ, they contemplate throwing in the towel on Christ because they bought a skinny mirror version of Christianity that promised them that they would no longer ever struggle again with sin. And then when they do struggle, they consider giving up, thinking to themselves, I'm in a battle I can't win. I'm in a battle I can't win, which is exactly the wrong way to think about it. See, we will still struggle because it is a battle to live the way God wants us to live when we've still got a sinful nature within us. But it's a battle now that we can't lose because by the grace of God, we've been promised deliverance from sin, past and present sin. See, Romans 7 is really an explanation of what Paul says back in Romans 5 verse 20, that God's grace is greater than all our sin. And not just greater than all of our past sin, but greater too than our present sin. So that not even our ongoing struggle with sin can thwart God's grace in our lives. Which is then why I want to wrap up this service by 
encouraging all of us to take a very simple step where we personalize this truth of Romans 7 about God's grace being greater than all our sin. At the bottom of your message notes, you're going to see a very simple equation that reads, grace is greater than blank. Grace is greater than blank. If you're not yet a Christian, but today you want to become a Christian, I would encourage you to simply put those words, all my sins, in that blank as this way of declaring your need for a Savior. And that today, you're putting your trust in Jesus to be your Savior. Trusting that His grace really is greater than all of your sins. For some of you, that's your next step today, to receive Jesus as Savior. To trust in the sufficiency of His work on the cross to forgive all your sins. Now, if you're already a Christian, I want to invite you to fill in the blank with that particular sin that you continue to struggle to believe is really forgiven. Or maybe that particular sin that you just simply continue to struggle with. Take the next moment or so to just get honest about where the struggle is real for you. And then name it. And then even better, write it down as this way of declaring that God's grace is greater than whatever sin you might be struggling with. Again, let me be clear. Grace is not a license to sin. I'm not trying to say we don't still need to confess and repent. We've already covered that loophole logic back in Romans chapter 6. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm saying today. I simply want to encourage us today to personalize the truth that God wants for us to personalize here out of Romans chapter 7. That despite my present struggle against the sinful nature, I do not have to despair. Because God has promised that he will keep his marriage vows to me in sickness and in health when I'm good and when I'm bad. In my virtue and in my vice. When I do what I'm supposed to do and when I blow it. That's why it's called grace, folks. And so, as the worship team prepares to lead us in our closing song, fill in that blank. Grace is greater than what? Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us in and through Christ. Jesus, thank you for your great love for us. That while we were still sinners, you were willing to come and pay the price that we could not and would not pay for ourselves. Holy Spirit, thank you for the way that you speak to us about those things that would help us to see our sins so that we then see our need for a Savior. I pray, Lord, that your Spirit would be speaking to hearts even now, opening eyes to the truth of the gospel. Lord, I pray too for my brothers and sisters here who have already put their trust in Christ. Lord, you know where we struggle. You know where we continue to experience temptation, where we even give way to besetting sins. Lord, of course I want to pray for freedom. Of course I want to pray for your spirit to do that work of leading us toward victory, which I know you want more than we do. But I want to pray too, Lord, for hope this morning. I want to pray against a spirit of despair. I want to pray for your grace to become so great in our mind's eye that we find hope, that we lean into the promise that you really will get us all the way to the finish line of our faith. So Lord, do what only you can do, even in these moments, reminding us that you've already won the battle, that we've won because we're in Christ. And then give us that hope that we need to keep pressing on with you. 